Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a special pleasure because I'm now at the alma mater of uh, Claude Shannon. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this talk is on shared information. Uh, Shannon's mutual information between two random variables or two random vectors is a fundamental and central concept in information theory, in communication, in probability and statistics, and many other applications. And uh, mutual information uh, derives its central importance in part from the fact that it has powerful operational meaning in several problem settings. Mutual information, of course, is a measure of mutual uh, dependence between two random variables or two random vectors. And so a natural question is, uh, what is a measure of mutual statistical dependence between an arbitrary number of random variables or an arbitrary number of terminals uh, or arbitrary number of signals? And that is the question this talk attempts to address. Uh, by considering a model in which multiple terminals uh, have access to correlated data and communicate among themselves, uh, a new concept of shared information emerges, and which seems to have some usefulness in problems of distributed computing and processing. Uh, shared information for the case of two random variables particularizes to mutual information. Now, whether this concept of shared information has any operational meaning beyond what I talk about here today, it's an open question. Uh, this talk is based on several separate joint works with Imre Chisar, who is at the Irani Institute of Mathematics with the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Sirin Nitinavarat and Himanshu Tyagi were at the University of Maryland. Sirin is now with Qualcomm. Himanshu is with the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And Shun Watanabe is with the Tokyo Institute of Agriculture and Technology. Now, Excuse me, Prakash, can I interrupt for one second? I sure. forgot to make an important announcement. Ah. We're having a reception afterwards out in the atrium. So ah, okay. all do stay. There will be some food and drinks. And sure. Thanks. So here's the outline. Uh, uh, it, the talk consists of three segments. So I'll start with a two-terminal model. Uh, define mutual information. Now, as I said, mutual information derives its importance in part from the fact that it has powerful operational meaning in several problem areas. So three of them. Uh, one is channel coding, where mutual information appears in channel capacity. In lossy source coding, where mutual information is central in, in the rate distortion function. And in binary hypothesis testing, where mutual information appears uh, <coughs> in what is known as Stein's lemma. So then I'll go to a new operation, operational meaning for mutual information. And to that end, I'll describe the notions of interactive communication and common randomness. And then we'll see how mutual information has this new operational meaning for a two-terminal model and how its counterpart for an arbitrary number of terminals uh, plays a role uh, in, in a multi-terminal model. And that's called shared information. And then we'll look at a few applications. So let's start. Uh, with a two-terminal model, I'm going to define mutual information and then uh, the operational meaning of uh, mutual information in these uh, problems. So mutual information is, as we know, a measure of mutual dependence between two random variables or two random vectors. Uh, so let x1 and x2 be real-valued random variables with a given joint probability distribution. Then the mutual information between an x1 and x2, which will be denoted by this expression here, is the expectation with respect to the given joint distribution of the log of the radon nicodem derivative of the joint distribution with the product of the marginals if the joint distribution is absolutely continuous with, to, with, the, with respect to the product of the marginals. Else, we set it to be infinity. So this, is, this expression is also equal to the kullback leibler divergence between the joint distribution of x1 and x2 and the product of the marginals, where the kullback leibler divergence is a measure of distance or separation between two distributions. In this talk, we are going to deal with random variables that are all finite valued, and they are given a joint uh, probability mass function. So when, for instance, x1 and x2 are finite valued, the mutual information between x1 and x2 can be written as the 
sum of the entropies of x1 and x2 minus the joint entropy and with a little bit of manipulation this can be written as the entropy of x1 minus the conditional entropy of x1 given x2 and because mutual information is symmetric with respect to the random variables this is also equal to the entropy of x2 minus the conditional entropy of x2 given x1 and again with some manipulation this can be written as the joint entropy of x1 and x2 minus the sum of the two conditional entropies. So these two forms of mutual information, the kullback leibler divergence and this particular form where we have the joint entropy minus the sum of the conditional entropies will have a special meaning uh, in this presentation. Now coming to the operational meaning of mutual information, perhaps the most celebrated uh, operational meaning arises in the theory of uh, channel coding uh, where let's say x1 and x2 are finite alphabets, they are the input and output alphabets of a noisy channel. The noisy channel is defined by uh, a stochastic matrix going from x1 to x2 which means that it's a matrix which, whose rows are all probability vectors and each row gives you the probability of the occurrence of the output of the channel for a given input. Uh, a sender of messages has one of m messages to be sent over this noisy channel. So in order to combat the noise in the channel, the message is encoded uh, by a mapping f. f of m is the code word corresponding to a message m. It's a sequence of length n coming from the alphabet script x1. That goes through the channel. The output is again a sequence of length n, perhaps from a different alphabet, and is decoded by the decoder into an estimate m hat of the message m that was transmitted. The channel is a discrete memoryless channel, which loosely speaking means that the output of the channel at any time instant depends only on the corresponding channel input and is conditionally independent of all the past inputs and the past outputs, uh, past inputs and future inputs, past, in, uh, past outputs and future outputs. Which means that the probability of seeing an output sequence of length n, given that an input sequence of length n was sent, factors this way is the product of the conditional probabilities at each time instant. So this is the model and the question uh, or the goal here is to make the code rate log m divided by n. There are m messages, log m is the number of bits to transmit each message divided by n because to transmit each message the channel is used n times. We'd like to make this code rate which is in bits per channel use as large as possible while keeping the probability of decoding error to be small. This is the probability that the decoder phi uh, looks at the output of the channel, does not decode it as m given that the message m was sent through the channel in the form of its code word and this is maximized over all possible messages. So it's called the maximum probability of error and we would like to keep this as small as we can and this problem is solved in an asymptotic sense as the block length of the code uh, words go to infinity. Uh, this is the operational question and the answer to this problem in terms of what is the largest code rate is known as the channel capacity and Shannon's celebrated formula was that this equals the mutual information between the channel input and the output where the, and this of course is a function of the joint uh, distribution of x1 and x2. The conditional of x2 given x1 must be consistent with the given channel and this is maximized with respect to the input distribution of the channel which says how the channel is being used. So this is the op one operational meaning for, for channel capacity. And here we want to maximize the mutual information because we want to maximize the rate of communication and that is done with respect to how the channel is being used. A second operational meaning is in lossy source coding, lossy source coding or rate distortion theory which is the theory that rules vector quantization. Here we are given a signal x1 of t, uh, it's an x1 valued iid source independent and identically distributed. We want to compress it and so the source output or the sequence from the source is transformed by an encoder into a code word which is actually an index which takes values let's say in the set 1 through j, the set of integers. A decoder then looks at the uh, index and decodes it into a code word x2, 1 through x2, n, perhaps from a different alphabet and the idea is to have this sequence represent this sequence ensuring that the distortion be between them does not become too large and the distortion is measured in terms of a distortion measure which 
specifies in some sense the distortion between the source sequence and its rep reproduced version. And this is what is known as a single letter distortion measure in that the distortion between sequences is the average of the per letter distortion. And in this problem, the goal is to make the compression uh, code rate, which is log of the number of, uh, number of code words, j, divided by n as small as possible because we are trying to compress the signal, but we don't want the distortion to be large. So we want that the probability that the distortion is less than or equal to some threshold delta should be large, uh, ideally tending to one, as the uh, length of the source sequence that's being mapped by the encoder tends to one as n goes to infinity. This is the operational requirement, and the answer to this problem is called the rate distortion function uh, at thresh at distortion level delta. This is again due to Shannon, and he showed that in this case the rate distortion function involves again the mutual information. Now this time we wish to minimize the mutual information because we are trying to compress the source. Uh, the marginal of x1 is given from the source and we minimize this subject to the conditional distribution of x2 given x1 which tells us how the input signal is mapped into, it, into its reconstruction. Uh, we want to minimize it but subject to the constraint that the distortion remains within delta. So this is the rate distortion function. And this is a second operational meaning for mutual information, in the, of, of mutual information. In this case, we are minimizing mutual information because we're trying to compress the signal. A third uh, operational meaning arises in simple binary hypothesis testing, where we are given a pair process, x1, t, x2, t. x1 and x2 have a joint distribution. The process is evolving in time in an IID manner. And the process, the pair process is uh, generated either according to uh, a hypothesis or a null hypothesis H0, which says that at each point in time, the, uh, the random variables are distribu distributed according to a given prescribed joint PMF, or alternatively, they are independent. That's the alternative hypothesis H1. And the uh, test, a tester wishes to, looks at a pair sequence of length n has to decide whether the sequence was generated by H0 or H1. And so randomization is allowed in making decisions. Therefore, the test is to decide H0 with some probability t that it decides 0, given the observations, or it decides H1 with this probability, which is a complementary probability, given the data. And in these problems, the question is to make what is called the probability of a misdetection. This is the probability that H1 is actually true. I'm sorry, H0, H1 is true. A, the misdetection is to say that H0 was true when H1 is actually true. We would like to minimize it. This is the probability of error of the second kind, subject to a constraint on the probability of error of the first kind, which is often referred to as the probability of a false alarm. And the false alarm is to say H1 when H0 is actually true. And so we look at the probability of, of saying H0 when H1 is actually true. We want to minimize this over all tests or decision rules, subject to a constraint on the probability of a false alarm, which is what this really says. And then we are looking at the best exponential decay of the probability of a misdetection as a function of n, the length of the observations. And the result is called Stein's Lemma. It appears in the, pa in the paper of Chernoff in 1956, who attributes it to Stein. And the answer is that the best exponential decay rate of the probability of error of the second kind is, has exponent, which is the divergence between the joint distribution of x1 and x2 and the product of the marginals, which is the mutual information between x1 and x2. So larger the uh, mutual information between uh, x1 and x2, the easier it is to tell these two hypotheses apart. So these are classical operational meanings for mutual information. And uh, we now go to the second segment of the talk where uh, we'll see uh, another operational meaning for mutual information which is less well known. And that involves the concepts of interactive communication and common randomness. And as I said before, we'll first do the two terminal model where we'll see this new significance for mutual information and then see what it means for, the M for an a model with an arbitrary number of terminals where the concept of shared information emerges. 
So I'll start by looking at the model, and then we'll look at the two different concepts. Two different concepts, interactive communication and common randomness. So the model is called the multi-terminal model. Uh, there are M terminals. The set of terminals is indexed by 1 through M, and script M defines this set of terminals. These terminals observe data. And the data is described by random variables x1 through xm. We take them to be finite valued random variables with a known joint distribution. Terminal i observes data xi. Now here, the data could be, we are taking them to be random variables. They could be random vectors. We are not assuming any evolution in time. But this, this x1 through xm could be time sequences as well. If they are time sequences, we are not making any assumptions regarding stationarity or IID behavior. All that is assumed is that we know the joint distribution of the random variables x1 through xm. These m terminals wish to cooperate to perform a given computational task in a distributed manner. And to this end, they communicate among themselves <coughs> in multiple rounds of what is called interactive communication. It is assumed that the ch uh, channel between these terminals, this communication channel, is noiseless as perfect communication. It has unlimited capacity, so there are no constraints on the rate of communication. And furthermore, the communication is in a broadcast mode, namely all the terminals hear all the communication. Uh, what is interactive communication? Now, in information theory, in communication, we generally deal with one-shot communication or autonomous communication, where each terminal communicates based only on the data that it has. Uh, there, are some, uh, 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 there are some cases where there are multiple rounds of communication, for instance, in feedback models or feed-forward models, also in some instances of network uh, information theory or communication, but we usually don't have multiple rounds of interactive communication. On the other hand, in uh, theoretical computer science, since the uh, seminal work of Andrew Yao in 1979, the, the, the concept of interactive communication is bread and butter. Uh, applications range from cryptography to function computation. Uh, usually the emphasis is on two, two terminal models, although now some uh, models with more terminals are being considered. And the general approach is to test the performance of given algorithms uh, using worst case converse bounds or converse bounds that are based on worst case uh, computational complexity or communication complexity. So interactive communication, what is interactive communication? We are going to assume that the communication between, among the M terminals occurs in consecutive time slots in R rounds. In each round of communication, every terminal takes its turn to communicate. Uh, the corresponding random variables that represent the communication are given by this. So F11 through F1M is the, uh, is the communication in round one by the terminals one through M. Then we go to round two all the way through our rounds. So for instance, F11 is the communication in round one by terminal one. It's only, this is where things start. So this communication is going to depend on the data at terminal one, which is X1. So F11 is some function of X1. F12, which is missing here, would be the communication in round one by terminal two. It would be some function of the local data X2 and of the previous communication. And in general, FJI, denotes the communication in round j by terminal i. It would be some function of the local data xi at terminal i and of all previous communication. Now, uh, a special uh, case of this interactive communication with which we are more familiar is, is simple communication, where the communication takes place in just one round. The communication has m components, one corresponding to each terminal, fi, uh, is the communication from terminal I, and it's based only on the local data. So that's simple communication. Uh, examples of interactive communication. Uh, first is, there's some examples here, the data exchange problem. The data exchange problem is the following. There are M terminals, uh, each, there's a large common file, and each uh, terminal uh, has partial knowledge of a portion of the file. And the accumulation of all of this partial knowledge is the entire file. All the terminals wish to recover the entire common file, and to this end, they communicate among themselves interactively. 
This, at the end of this exercise, every terminal learns the entire file, becomes omniscience, and therefore this problem also is known as the omniscience problem. Second problem is that of signal recovery, which is a data compression problem. All the terminals wish to recover the signal at any one particular terminal, and to this end they communicate among themselves, and uh, this is a problem of data compression. Function computation, well, we are given a function of all the collective data. So for instance, we wish to compute the average or the maximum or the minimum of the data at the multiple terminals. Each terminal wishes to compute the value of this function and to this end, all the terminals communicate among themselves. And the fourth, uh, fourth application is in cryptography, in secret key generation where the terminals have this data x1 through xm as privileged data and then they communicate among themselves using this communication F uh, interactively, and eavesdropper has access to F at the terminals wish to form a secret key, which can then be used for encrypted communication among themselves. Okay, now, um, before I go further, uh, I'll give you a very simple uh, toy example that illustrates the benefits of interactive communication over simple communication. Uh, I like this example very much. Uh, in fact, every time I look at this example, I say to myself, what an example. And so here is what an example, and it's due to Shun Watanabe. It's an example in function computation. There are two terminals uh, with data x1 and x2. Uh, x1 consists of a pair x11, x12, x2 consists similarly of a pair x21 and x22. And x, the four random variables are purely random bits, mutually independent. And the two terminals wish to compute a function. And the function is to see if the data at the two terminals match or not. So the function g is the indicator function that the data at terminal 1 matches the data at terminal 2. The function is 0 or 1 valued. And the terminals have to communicate to compute this. Both wish to compute it. If we use only simple communication, then there's no alternative but to each terminal sending its data to the other side. right? In this case, uh, that's what this shows. Then the communication complexity, because all the bits are purely random, is going to be four bits. And furthermore, there's no privacy. Also, although privacy is not a concern in this, in this work, uh, it's something to consider nonetheless. So in this case, terminal one or terminal two or an observer of this communication will learn all the data at all the terminals. Now, by contrast, if we go to a simple inter interactive communication protocol involving one round of communication, but communication both ways, now it's interactive because terminal one just sends its data to terminal two. Terminal two computes the value of the function and then ferries it back to terminal one. In this case, it's, it's easy to compute that the entropy, uh, if the complexity of the communication is measured in entropy, then the complexity is going to be 2.81 bits. If you write the logs and the probabilities, this is what you get. This uh, protocol so also affords some measure of privacy. For instance, terminal two or an observer of this communication will learn of the data at terminal one because it's being sent across. On the other hand, terminal one or an observer of this communication either learns that x2 equals x1 with probability 2.25, which is the probability with which the data match, or with probability 0.75 that x2 differs from x1. So using the simple interactive communication protocol, the complexity is reduced and there is some measure of privacy. And this is one of the reasons why interactive communication, although it's more co complex than, 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 than simple communication, is preferred in many of these applications. And concerning uh, what an example, uh, can we do with a communication complexity of less than 2.81 bits? That's not known. It's an open issue, even for the simple case. Uh, there's a large body of work on interactive communication. Uh, there's no way I can do justice to the work that's been done here. But the work can be loosely categorized into three groups. First, the exact function computation, which began with the work of Andrew Yao. And here, we wish to compute the value of a function exactly, without any error. Then information theoretic function computation where uh, some uh, error is allowed. And then compressing interactive communication where the communication is done after compressing it so that the complexity is reduced. Okay. Now, uh, demos is not here, but interactive communication is used in other domains as well. 
And he was the one who told me that in mathematical economics, uh, especially in mechanism design, where mechanisms include markets, interactive communication among agents has been used for quite some time, perhaps even before then in the communication complexity literature. And uh, Demo sent me a variety of uh, references, and I picked two of them here. And it looks like, uh, for me, first of all, it's been difficult to absorb this material because it's written with different terminology and a different language. But some of the results they have are, uh, are intriguingly close to what you see in the communication complexity literature. Although I must say I've, I've not been able to, to understand fully what the work that's been done, but Demos would be an authority on this. All right, so now we, uh, we've, we've seen so far, we have the multi-terminal model. We know what interactive communication is, but we had there was no purpose uh, ascribed to it. Uh, and now we look at the second concept, which is the concept of common randomness. And common randomness is pivotal uh, to this approach. So what is common randomness? Uh, we have M terminals, they have correlated data. And they communicate among themselves cooperatively. At the end of this exercise, they, they agree on some shared bits with large probability. And these shared bits are called common randomness. These shared bits are are generated by the M terminals from their own local data and from the communication. And all the terminals agree on the shared bits with large probability and it's called common randomness. And this common randomness uh, underlies the, a, a, a given computational task that, or of some, some task that the M terminals must perform cooperatively but in a distributed manner. So formally, uh, this is what uh, common randomness is for any epsilon between zero and one, and think of epsilon as as um, as an error probability. Given any interactive communication f, a random variable l, which is a function of all the data in the model, is epsilon common randomness for the m terminals. If we can find local estimates generated at each terminal l i which are, each li is a function only of the local data and of the interactive communication among the terminals, such that L agrees with all these local estimates simultaneously with probability exceeding one minus epsilon. So they all sh these are the shared bits. So L constitutes the shared bits on which all the terminals agree with, prob with large probability, and each li was generated locally at terminal i from its own local data xi and from the communication. Going back to the examples we looked at, in the data exchange problem where all the terminals wish to gather all the portions of the file, uh, the common randomness is omniscient. It's a knowledge of all the random variables in the model. In the signal recovery problem, let's say all the terminals wish to recover the signal at some terminal i star. Well, the terminals will generate common randomness which will include xi star, but also include more information because they've been communicating. The communication will also form part of the common randomness. Similarly, in a function computation problem, if, we wish, if the terminals wish to compute a function g of all the data, the common randomness will include the, the computed value of the function. In cryptography, uh, our secret common randomness, the m terminals wish to generate uh, a common randomness L with the attribute that it is independent or nearly independent of the communication that was used to generate it. Such a common randomness can then be used as a secret key for encrypted communication among themselves, for instance, using a one-time pad. Now, in all of these applications, the common randomness that is generated generally exceeds what was needed. So a natural question is, if you are given a computational task, which requires a certain amount of common randomness to be generated, what is the minimum amount of interactive communication that is needed for the purpose? We can ask a different question. If we, if, if we are given an interactive communication protocol, what is the maximum amount of common randomness that can be generated by it? And sometimes an answer to the second question helps provide an answer to the first one. And that's the approach we're going to take. So here's a basic operational question. Uh, given a com uh, in an interactive communication protocol F, what is the maximum amount of common randomness that can be generated by the M terminals? Now, because the communication among the terminals is public, everybody gets to see the communication, so the bits that are associated with the communication already constitute common randomness. The question therefore becomes, 
what is the maximum amount of common randomness that the terminals can generate that is distinct from the communication that was used to generate it. And that is measured by the conditional entropy of L given F and has the effect of purging away from the common randomness the communication that was used to generate it. And so the question is, what is the maximum amount of common randomness that can be generated in this way? Uh, we'll look at the answer in two steps. The first is to look at a fundamental structural property of interactive communication without any heed to the purpose uh, for which it's being uh, used. And the second will be an upper bound on the amount of common randomness that can be generated by a given interactive communication protocols. So we'll start with the case of m equal to two terminals. And this is the fundamental property of interactive communication for the case of two terminals. The result is due to Maura and Alswida and Shisar. We have two terminals observing data x1 and x2. They use an interactive communication protocol F and a basic structural property is that the conditional mutual information between x1 and x2 given condition on the interactive communication F can be no bigger than the original mutual information between x1 and x2. So conditioning on any interactive communication protocol can only decrease the mutual information. In particular, if x1 and x2 were independent to begin with, then upon conditioning 2, they remain uh, independent. Uh, it's very easy to prove this, and uh, we'll actually do the proof, and this is a good exercise in, 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 in an undergraduate or a graduate class on information theory. And the proof is as follows. So let's take any interactive communication F, it consists of R rounds. So F11 is a communication in round one by terminal one. This is a communication in round one by terminal two and so on. Let's start with the mutual information between X1 and X2. The first communication F1 is a function of X1. So I can put it here without altering the value of the mutual information. So we get this. Then use the chain rule for mutual information. It's bounded below by the mutual information between X1 and X2 given F11. Condition on F1 and knowing X2 the communication F12 is a function of X2 and F11, right? It's a function of the local data and the previous communication. So I can stick in F12 here without altering the value of the mutual information. And so you get this, and then we use the chain rule once more to get this lower bound. So we can iterate, and then you see therefore that the mutual information between X1 and X2 given interactive communication can never exceed uh, the original mutual information. Now, uh, you know, this thing is such a simple thing, but it's extremely useful. Uh, it's used widely in the communication complexity literature. Uh, it's been given lots of different names, and sometimes uh, the original derivation is forgotten, but it's an extremely useful property. Now, a uh, question is, uh, what happens, what is the counterpart of this result for the case of M random variables, right? To help set it up, we make the following observation. This is the, uh, this is the uh, basic structural property of interactive communication. With a little bit of manipulation, we can write it this way. It says that the entropy of the communication is bounded below by the entropy of the communication projected on the data at the various terminals and summed up. We'll see how this extends to the case of M terminals, but before I do that, I need to get an upper bound on the maximum amount of common randomness that two terminals can generate using interactive communication. And that is done here. If we have L as any common randomness that the two terminals can generate, and using this property, uh, the structural property of interactive communication that we just saw, you can get with a little bit of effort that the conditional entropy of L given F, which is what we seek to bound above, is bounded above by the joint entropy of the random variables x1 and x2 minus the sum of the two conditional entropies, plus a nuisance term which tends to zero as epsilon, the error probability in common randomness generation tends to zero. This thing is, of course, this difference is equal to the mutual information between x1 and x2. And so we get that you can take any common randomness L for two terminals generated with any interactive communication the conditional entropy of L given F can never exceed the mutual information between X1 and X2, which is, of course, the divergence between the joint distribution of X1 and X2 and the product of the marginals. And indeed, when X1 and X2 are, are generated by IRD data in time, it can be shown that this upper bound can be attained. So if we have two terminals, then 
the largest amount of mutual information or the largest, I'm sorry, the largest rate of common randomness that two terminals can generate that is distinct from the interactive communication that was used to generate it is mutual information. And this gives another operational meaning to mutual information. Okay. Now the question is, uh, what is the extension? What is the natural counterpart for m random variables? So again, it will be done in two steps. The first step is to find uh, a, a property, a structural property for interactive communication among m terminals. And the second is to find an upper bound on the maximum amount of common randomness that can be generated using any interactive communication. So this is the uh, uh, structural property of interactive communication for m terminals. Uh, there are two main results, theorem one and theorem two. The first one says what the structural property is. So here again, uh, it says that if you have M terminals, they engage in interactive communication, then the entropy of the interactive communication is always bounded below by a linear combination of conditional entropies, where the coefficients in this linear combination come from what is known as a fractional partition. I won't get into the uh, details of it. Uh, it's a combinatorial object, and the, the lambda b's are weights that lie between zero and one, and they, they must satisfy certain constraints. And the entropy of F is always bounded below by, by a linear combination of conditional entropy terms of this kind. Where the Bs are the following. So you have the set of terminals 1 through M. We take all proper non-empty subsets of the set of terminals 1 through B, 1 through M, call them B, associate with each a weight lambda B, which must satisfy certain constraints. So if we were to use the structural property of interactive communication to prove converse bounds in a problem of communication complexity, this would be the result that should be used. This result also turns out to be a special case of subsequent work due to Madhuman and Tetali on uh, inequalities that are satisfied by submodular functions of which entropy is one. So this is the property. Now the question to ask is, what is the maximum amount of common randomness that can be generated by M terminals that engage in interactive communication. And to help uh, see what the answer might be, here is a naive suggestive analogy. And that is the following. For the case of two terminals, the property, the interactive communication property was that the entropy of F is bounded below by the sum of the two conditional entropies, which was equivalent to saying that the mutual information between X1 and X2 given F is no bigger than that of the mutual information between X1 and X2. And recall that the mutual information between x1 and x2, which appears on the right-hand side, was the maximum amount of common randomness that two <laughs> terminals could generate. So the question is, can we take the analogous structural property for interactive communication for m terminals and then write it in such a way that the left side is conditioned on the communication, but the right side is not, but it's the same quantity without the conditioning? And the answer is yes. So we can write this thing here in this particular way, where the left side is the conditional entropy of all the random variables in the model, condition on the communication, minus this stuff, and the right side is the same thing without the conditioning. And that leads to the following question. Does the right-hand side here, the, the sh part shown in red, does it suggest a measure of mutual statistical dependence between among the random variables x1 through xm? Or in other words, does this lead to some kind of a counterpart of mutual information for the case of m random variables. And that leads to the second main result, which says that given any epsilon between 0 and 1, for any common randomness generated by m terminals using communication f, the conditional entropy of L given f is always bounded above by the joint entropy of all the random variables in the model minus a linear combination of conditional entropies across cut sets B, B complement. This is a nuisance term. The, uh, the coefficients in the linear expansion here are the weights that come from a fractional partition that we saw in the case of the structural property of interactive communication. And this is true for every structural, uh, for every uh, uh, fractional partition. And in particular, uh, the proof of this theorem, just like its uh, particularization for the case of two terminals, depends on the previous theorem, which was the structural property of interactive communication. And furthermore, if the data at the terminals is generated by an IRD process, 
this upper bound can actually be attained. And so to paraphrase this result, and this, res and this term here is called shared information because this is the maximum amount of common randomness that M terminals can generate using interactive communication where this common randomness is distinct from the communication that was used to generate it. And to paraphrase that result, the maximum amount of such common randomness with the communication purged from it is equal to the joint distribution of the, uh, is equal to the entropy of the model minus the maximum overall fractional partitions because the previous upper bound was valid for every fractional partition. And the notation that we have for that is shared information. Okay, now, uh, so this is shared information. is the maximum amount of common randomness that M terminals can generate using interactive communication F, which is distinct from the, communica the communication that was used to generate it. Now, mutual information uh, can be written as a kulbach kulbach leibler divergence. And it's always nice when we write a mutual information quantity in terms of divergence because we can see, uh, we can get more insights from it. And this shared information is in the spirit of mutual information, so can it be written in terms of a kulbach leibler divergence? Uh, we'll get to that, but before that, I just wanted to say that these two main theorems can be extended to random variables with densities, and in fact, to a larger class of uh, probability measures on, on separable uh, metric spaces. But coming back to the question of whether shared information can be written in terms of a divergence, well, this is shared information. This is the expression that we just saw. For the case of two terminals, this first term is the entropy of x1 and x2. The second term, because it's only two terminals, there's only one non-trivial partition consisting of two atoms. So that's the sum of the two conditional entropies. The difference is, of course, the mutual information, which is the divergence between the joint distribution of x1 and x2 and the product of the marginals. Now, what happens for the case of m terminals or m random variables? There is an expression in terms of, of divergence. So let me explain this. We have the, here, this is the divergence between the joint distribution of the random variables x1 through xm. And then we do the following. We take this set of m terminals and we partition them into teams. We partition them into k teams, where k is at least two and can be at, 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 at most, uh, can be as many as m, right? where each of the atoms of the partition is, is just singular. Now, what happens is that all the random variables within a team cooperate, function as one, but the teams are mutually independent across themselves. So this is the divergence between the joint distribution of x1 and x, x1 through xm and the product of the team marginals, where the team marginals are simply obtained from the given joint distribution. This is normalized by the number of atoms in the partition minus one. And then we minimize this with respect to all partitions of size k, and then take the minimum over all non-trivial partitions of size at least two and at most m. And this is the expression for shared information. In fact, this equals zero if and only if the joint distribution of x1 through xm uh, is independent across some cut set, bb complement. Now this expression was, uh, this is the expression for shared information. This, upper, this quantity here, this divergence form was derived by, uh, by us as an upper bound, which was shown to be tight in some cases. And then uh, Chung Chan and Li Zhang Zheng showed that this expression was exactly equal to what our upper bound was actually tight in general. Now comes the natural question. Does this notion of shared information have any operational meaning as a measure of mutual statistical dependence among random variables? And to ask, yeah, question. Is there any uh, monotonicity of the divergence term without the one over k minus one with respect to k? Yeah, if, if you do, if, yeah. As the k gets bigger. Yeah, so if you didn't have the normalization, if you didn't have the normalization by k, then the minimum would be obtained for k equal to two, right? And so this k minus one is crucial, yes. Uh, now, the third, last part of the, uh, the talk, application. So let's see if the shared information has any operational meaning in other problems. We return to the problem of omniscience or data exchange. Here the common randomness is x1 through xm. An application of theorem 2 gives us that the entropy of the communication must be always bounded below by the joint entropy of the model 
minus shared information, which for the case of just two terminals is the sum of the two conditional entropies, which is what we would expect from, from Slepian and Wolf, if, because if you had two terminals, they had data x1 and x2, each wishes to become omniscient, each should learn about the other, so the other must transmit to it at the conditional entropy rate. Uh, if we go to the problem of signal recovery, let's say where all the terminals wish to recover the signal at terminal 1, this is a problem of data compression, then with L equal to x1, common randomness is x1, we get that the entropy of the communication is bounded below by the entropy of x1 minus the shared information, which for the case of two terminals simply becomes that the entropy of the communication is bounded below by the conditional entropy of x1 and x2, which is again from uh, Slepian Wolf. Uh, a third problem is that of secret uh, common randomness. Here there are M terminals. They wish to generate a common randomness L uh, using communication F in such a way that F does not reveal anything about L to an observer of F. And this is called a secret key. By theorem 2, the entropy of L is close to the conditional entropy of L given F because of this information uh, condition. And this says that the entropy of any such L can be no bigger than the shared information. And this result has been used to prove that the maximum rate of a secret key that can be generated by M terminals cannot exceed shared information. Also, if M terminals wish to compute a function of their data using interactive communication F in such a way that the communication and observation of the communication by someone doesn't give away the value of the function, then the entropy of the function that's being computed necessarily cannot exceed shared information. Now, uh, one more uh, application is querying common randomness. Now, suppose instead of x1 through xm, the data were generated at each terminal in an IID fashion. In other words, you have random variables x1 through xm. They are evolving in time in an IID way according to a prescribed distribution. Each terminal observes one sequence. And they communicate among themselves using interactive communication F and generate common randomness L. This is a problem of querying common randomness. Someone observes this communication F. Let's call the person a querier. A querier observes this communication F alone. It doesn't know the data and seeks to resolve the value of this common randomness that these M terminals have generated by asking questions of the following kind. Is the common randomness equal to a value L with yes, no answers? Okay. An application is in trying to break a password or in biometric security or in hardware security. Uh, uh, in the case of what are known as puffs of physically un unclonable functions. On the other hand, the terminals wish to generate their common randomness using interactive communication so as to make the querier's burden as difficult as possible by inflicting on the querier a maximum number of queries. For instance, if the common randomness and the communication were independent or nearly independent, and the common randomness were uniformly distributed, the, the only thing that the querier can do is an exhaustive search, and the, it has to search over a space that can be exponential in n. And in fact, it turns out that we can generate common randomness using communication F so that the search of the querier is exponential, exponential in n. And the natural question is, what is the largest exponent that can be inflicted on the, on the querier? So formally, what this means is that we are seeking, if Q is the number of queries that the querier has to ask use, upon observing interactive communication F, and trying to uh, resolve the value of the common randomness L, asking questions of this kind that we just saw, then E is a query exponent if the number of such queries exceeds 2 to the power n e with probability p that tends to 1 as the block length goes to infinity, even when the there is optimization by the querier over the query strategies. It picks the best query strategy. And the largest such exponent is called the query exponent, and it uh, can be shown that the largest query exponent is in fact equal to the shared information. Uh, a last application, shared uh, information also appears as the best exponent of the probability of error of the second kind in the composite binary hypothesis testing problem where some restrictions are placed on the nature of the common randomness and on the extent of communication, interactive communication. 
And this is in recent work by Himanshu Tyagi and Shun Watanabe. This appeared in the information theory transactions of the IEEE last year. So in closing, uh, we ask the question, uh, how useful is this concept of shared information? So it does have operational meaning in, in, in uh, specific cases of distributed processing. For instance, if we have data at the M terminals evolving in an IID fashion, in other words, you have random variables X1 through XM that evolve in time in an IID way and each terminal I sees the sequence XIN, then shared information-based results are asymptotically tight in N when we wish to compute the minimum rate of communication for omniscience in the data uh, exchange problem, the maximum rate of a secret key, the largest query exponent which we just saw, saw uh, necessary conditions for secure function computations and in a variety of problems in information theoretic cryptography. However, there are many open questions. So for instance, does shared information have any operational significance in general problems of network source coding or channel coding. Just as mutual information appears as a central concept in rate distortion theory and channel coding for two terminal models, does shared information play any role in any of these problems? And I don't, we don't know of any, any, any application so far. Uh, here it was assumed that the communication took place over noiseless channels, but suppose the interactive communication is corrupted by noise, then what is the corresponding uh, implication for shared information? Uh, recently, Chung Chan and uh, his collaborators have been looking at this notion of shared information, which they call multivariate mutual information. Uh, to examine data clustering problems as they appear in machine learning applications. And the idea is that you have a large body of data. There are some parts of the data that are similar. They, they look like teams. And then there is a lot of dissimilarity across categories, namely across teams. And they use the notion of shared information to quantify uh, such structural behavior. And so, these are open questions among many, and that is that. Thank you. But it was George who was the prover, along with Ken Sheen, of the ergodic theorem. So he was both involved in probability and in symbolic logic, which was an interesting uh, combination.